In this video, I will cover angiosperms, also known as the flowering plants. They're the largest and most diverse group of plants, in large part thanks to the flowers. Along with the gymnosperms, they make up the seed plants. I covered gymnosperms in a separate video, which I'll link, but to summarize, they're plants with naked seeds that aren't covered by another structure. Gymnosperms depend on the wind for pollination. The wind has to carry pollen from the male cones to the female cones before they get fertilized. So the success rate of pollination really comes from chance. You produce as much pollen as possible and hope that it hits a female cone. By contrast, for angiosperms, the seeds are covered by what we traditionally think of as fruit. Angiosperms have a different strategy of reproduction using flowers. There's a lot of different types of flowers, not just aesthetically or visually, but also structurally. To start, let's go over what makes up a perfect flower. A perfect flower has male and female parts. The female part is called the pistil, and the pistil has three main parts. At the very top is the stigma, which is like a sticky landing pad that the pollen falls on and sticks to. And from there, it goes down the style, which is a long tube that connects down to the ovary. And the ovary is where the female genetic are contained. If the pollen can reach the ovary, fertilization happens. Then you have the male parts of the flowers, which are called stamens, and these are usually surrounding the female part of the flower. Stamens have two parts. You have the anther at the top, which contains the pollen and is sometimes referred to as the pollen head, and this is supported by the long filament. Surrounding the male and female parts are the petals. There's a lot of different forms and shapes, not only to attract pollinators, but also to almost force certain insects to pollinate them. Some of these flowers look different under UV light, and that serves to highlight like a landing pad for the insects that can see that light. Lastly, around the petals are the sepals. These are usually green. They protect the rest of the flower parts when they're still in the flower bud, and once the flower opens, it still supports the rest of the flower. So this is what a botanist would consider a perfect flower. There's a lot of variations where maybe you only have the male parts, maybe you only have the female parts, maybe all of this has shrunk down really small, and instead of petals, you have leaves that have become petal-like, and so on. For example, in dogwoods, what we think of as the petals are actually leaves called bracts that have changed to look like petals, but they're not actually part of the flower. The flower is just that cluster in the center. And some flowers have evolved so that they're now wind-pollinated like oaks, which seems kind of counterintuitive when the point of having the flower was to get specific pollinators. But that leads us into the next part, which is that the flower develops into a fruit. So pollination occurs when the pollen lands on the stigma, the sticky female part, and it goes down to the ovary where pollination happens. Seeds form inside this ovary with the genetic material of the male and the female parent. And that ovary swells up into what becomes the fruit, and this surrounds the seed. The fruit is usually specialized for how it's meant to be dispersed. If you're trying to attract a bird, you might have really bright fruits. If you're trying to be dispersed by wind, maybe you'll have propeller-like appendages like in maples, ash, tree of heaven. There's a huge variety of fruit and each type has a different name, but a lot of these People don't traditionally think of fruit because they're not fleshy and they weren't bred for us to consume, but these are all botanically fruits. I mentioned earlier that you can have separate male and female flowers. When you have a perfect flower, you have male and female parts on the same flower, that's called senecious. If the male and female parts are on separate flowers, you have two potential arrangements. The first one is called monecious, 
where the separated male and female flowers are on the same tree. Think of it as mono equals one. In the second arrangement called dioecious, you have the separated male and female flowers on separate trees. Think of di equal, equals two. Only if you have a dioecious species can you have separate male and female trees. You might be thinking, why the hell do I need to know this? There are actually very practical reasons. Your clients might pick trees for various reasons. Oftentimes, they want a tree that is less messy. So if they want a tree that doesn't bear fruit because they don't want to clean up after it, you have to pick a male tree. In order to pick a truly male tree, you have to have male-only flowers and you have to have a dioecious species. An example is um, Chinese pistache. This is very popular in the California Bay Area. And Keith Davy is a very popular male cultivar. If you plant a Keith Davy pistache, you're guaranteed to never have fruit because it's a male cultivar. But if you plant just a Chinese pistache, not a cultivar, you might end up with these clusters of fruits that some people find really messy. But in picking male trees to avoid fruits, there's always negatives to that too, because male trees produce pollen. So the more male trees you plant in the landscape, the higher the pollen count and the more allergens you might be introducing into the environment. In popular media, this is called botanical sexism, where people prefer the male plants in order to reduce messiness. I've also seen the opposite. Um, in Phoenix, Arizona, they actually have an ordinance where they prohibit planting specific male trees because of allergens. Um, here's a screenshot of the code where they prohibit male mulberries and olives. Another benefit of knowing flowers is that they get really specialized and you can identify a species down to the family based strictly on the flowers and the fruit. Might not sound that impressive, but if you're on the other side of the world and you see a flower that you recognize, it really helps you narrow down what that species might be. There's always variations to the rule, but it gives you a really good idea. And I experienced this when I first started working. There was a tree right outside my workplace. I had never seen it before. The bark and leaves were totally unrecognizable, but it was in flower and it had white flowers that reminded me of trumpet vines or the Bignoniaceae family. Once I figured that out, I was able to figure out that it was a china doll. And this species is common as a house plant but not very popular as an ornamental tree. Seven years later, I've still only seen a handful of these trees in the landscape, so someone might have planted their houseplant outside. I thought it was pretty cool how I was able to figure that out. To summarize, angiosperms are also known as the flowering plants. They're a very large and diverse group of plants thanks to their flowers and their fruit. In terms of management, they're not managed all too differently from gymnosperms, though specific types of angiosperms like monocots versus dicots, there are separate considerations for them. I've covered those two groups in other videos, which I will link in the description.